Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cloud Wars Live, where we explore today's digital revolution by speaking with business executives and thought leaders who are changing how the world lives, works, plays, learns, and dreams. Today, we've got a special episode of Cloud Wars Live to share with you. This was done at a live event a couple of weeks ago. It was at Carnegie Mellon University and within the business school at CMU, they've got a group called the Corporate Startup Lab. And that's actually the brainchild of one of our regular monthly guests, Sean Amirati. And Sean is the founder and director of the Corporate Startup Lab in the business school at Carnegie Mellon. He and his team put on a one day forum on the corporate startup approach in the corporate startup environment and what's going on these days and we did a session of cloud wars live at that event it also features sean as well as another of our monthly guests tony uphoff who's the ceo of thomas and they discuss a wide range of ideas between themselves and also take some questions from the audience now while the audio and video for this episode are not ideal you can hear it you can see it and it is some really good content in there so we wanted to make this available to all of you to be able to see it. So this is, again, this is from a live event at Carnegie Mellon University about a week and a half ago. Uh, it's part of the corporate startup lab there. And the participants here are two of our monthly guests, Sean Amirati, who's a professor at the Carnegie Mellon University Business School and a venture capitalist, and Tony Uphoff, the CEO of Thomas, and me, your humble moderator. Thanks, and we hope you enjoy the show. Probably known Bob for over 40 years, and there's so much I can say, but there's so little time, and that's probably good for the audience and for Bob. But I, I just have to say, in all fairness, that Bob was a corporate entrepreneur before I ever heard the term. I look at him now, since he's crossed over the past couple of years, he's really an infopreneur. And I'm really looking forward to what you all have cooked up to. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Uh, as um, Woody said before, you're all going to stand between your lunch. We're going to have some fun here. Uh, it gets some great insights. Cloud Wars Live, as Lou said, is a podcast that I do. We've done about 120 episodes. And a couple of our monthly guests, we call them the Digital All Stars, are Sean, who most of you know, and also Tony Alcock, who's the CEO of Thomas. And Tony himself has taken a family owned, 120 year old, media company and transformed it in the middle of Manhattan into a data services uh, company richly involved in what's going on in industrial markets. So the premise of what we try to do at Cloud Wars Live is not talk about the different cloud technologies and all, but the impact that these technologies are having on businesses, transformation, and the way that entrepreneurship inside all these different industries, disruption is happening faster than ever before. Those are some of the things we're going to try to get at. I just had a couple quick slides to open things up, but before we show this first slide, I wanted to ask you, this week, Goldman Sachs, not exactly a real wild, controversial type of company, but they put out a statement. They said, they identified a group, a professional group that they said, these are the people who are going to design the future of institutional finance. Anybody, let's toss out a guess, who is that group that Goldman Sachs feels will drive the future of institutional finance? Any thoughts on that? Isn't it like cloud developers or something? They want to move markets in the AWS? Yeah, developers. So we have institutional finance in the future now being driven by developers. That's Goldman Sachs' position on this. Um, sure. Is it like a Yeah. So this was their line. That we believe developers will create this future of institutional finance. We want to power this transformation. So one other thing here, earlier this week, uh, I'm not going to identify the company unless you really want me to, but one of the biggest tech companies, most influential tech companies in the world had their quarterly earnings call. And they used that to showcase uh, some, not formal research, but conversations they've had with hundreds of CEOs in all different industries around the world. And I want to share a couple of the thoughts from there. Everybody wants to be more conscious for centric, deliver experience, and exceed expectations. But they said they're oriented their businesses around the customer, three pillars of digital transformation, technology, business model, and culture. We're helping them break down silos, liberate their data, and so on like that, 
360 view of every customer. That's the holy grail of digital transformation. We'll be happy to share these afterward. Uh, I'll be happy to do that because I know they're a little hard to see here. Same earnings call, holy grail number two. The holy grail of computing is a single source of truth. It used to be that that's what the CFO wanted for finance. Now, the, single, the, the holy grail here too is a single view of the customer across departments, across regions, across countries, across data silos, and so forth. So why has this been so hard? It's the silos that big companies tend to build up intentionally or otherwise over time. As he says here, they come in the form of technology, data, organizational, and so on like that. They need the autonomy to come together to produce a single, seamless view of the customer. See, you're one of the largest insurance companies in the world who's talking about a growth of silos. He goes farther, organizational silos, process silos, business model silos, and data silos. And I think this is the most important thing they said on this earnings call. The result of that sort of silo thinking is a product out view of the world instead of a customer in view of the world. And that's paralyzing to companies trying to do business here today at the dawn of the digital age. So for big companies to be able to achieve more of that startup type of attitude mindset, some of the great work that Sean and Dave and others have been doing here, they've got to be able to change this around. So I think, as they said before, the three pillars that run is it, it's transformation, it's process, and it's culture. Maybe culture is the most important of those three. So enough of the preamble. Sean and Tony, we're going to flip it over to you. Um, guys, Industrial companies or other sorts of companies, the, the trend here definitely is to go toward this notion of digital transformation. Why do some companies get it and why do some companies not get it? Tony, what do you think? No, I think, and just Bob, a little bit of background to that question. Thomas, uh, our core platform is called thomasnet.com, and so we served for 120 years, not as a platform, was in print at one point in time. Um, it, it, we serve a broad audience. So small, medium, and very large companies. Um, what's happening in the industrial sector is fascinating in that it is a late adopting uh, sector of the marketplace in terms of digital transformation and technology. And that's not a pejorative statement, it's just a fact of, of how it's working. And um, the, the, I think one of the reasons that, that some companies get it and some companies don't is they, they don't quite understand the, the scope of the digital transformation of your most simple example. So we're in one of the hotbeds for advanced manufacturing, which is remodeling technology. So think of that as the factory floor, but what a lot of industrial and manufacturing companies don't think about is the front office is now going for a digital transformation. Your customers have gone online. They aren't going to talk to a sales rep. They may never talk to someone at your company. They're evaluating 70 to 75% of the purchase process before they're willing to engage with you. That's a front to shift for industrial companies. It's a radical paradigm shift for them. So the companies that we work with that seem to be more enlightened is they look at the whole thing from interest to invoice. So they, they look at this as a continuum, if you will. Uh, that makes sense. It's time to do a bunch of discrete pieces. So cash to quote, interest in. Okay. Yeah, you know, there's no that uh, it's cash to quote, which most you know companies, you know, how many how many quotes did I put out and how much how many turned into business. That, that's actually the last 30% of something else. If you don't understand the front 70%, it's kind of an irrelevant metric. So we're, we're, we're measuring the wrong thing in many respects. So I think the companies that get it, and Sean, you, you and I talk about this too, I think are ones that are kind of looking at the whole playing field and then looking at the pieces within that, if that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I think what happens too is digital transformation is the topic that, you know, it's like an easy handle for executives to get like, you know what we need to do? We need to do digital transformation. It reminds me like a few years ago, like when everybody needed an app strategy. Right? Like remember like we, we I, what are we gonna do on with an app? I don't know, but like but we sure need one. Get me one of those apps before the next board meeting. Like, we, need a, we need a digital transformation. And and so and so I think companies that do that that use that rallying cry effectively, use it to to make some cultural changes in the organization. To, to integrate digital into more of what they do. And I think that's really compelling. I, I think 
a lot of companies may think they're doing digital transformation, but but probably Bob, from where you sit as more of an expert, you would look at it and say, like, actually, you guys really aren't. All you've done is maybe change the dress code in your organization, right? And, and I like wearing jeans as much as the next guy, but like that doesn't actually make you a digitally transformed company. Uh, if it did, your HR directors would be amazing technologists, but it actually turns out that's just kind of not the case, right? Um, so I think that, to me, that's, that's part of it. But I think that the great ones are doing what, what Sunny's talking about, right? They're saying, okay, if we're gonna, if we're gonna transform how we operate, to uh, work with our customer base that is going to be more digitally needed, they're going to have different expectations than they do. Let's start with what the customers care about and kind of radiate out from there. And I, and I think that then you see some pretty amazing things happening. I think there's a, another connected piece here too, which is you know the, the, the how, which is what you're starting yeah. to really touch on, Sean. And I, I don't hear this enough from companies. It's great to have a strategy and let's call digital transformation a strategy over the white thing. Um, the back of them is the house far more important, and so what's the framework you yeah. use? And one of the panelists earlier today uh, referenced jobs to be done, and so the, the late economist and Harvard professor Peter Levitt, uh, as a way of teeing up the methodology, used to use the phrase, um, people don't want to buy a quarter inch drill, they want to drill a quarter inch pole. And I think really understanding the sure. jobs to be done with the customers, taking customer success out of the clouds and, and not make it such a slogan, but really start to think profoundly about how is this customer going to rent my product to get a job done? That's really what you're trying to do, and therefore, then line up your digital transformation to these that you can around those jobs to be done. I think that's the how is the hard part. Absolutely. What even what you said there, right? Like, rent my like that means that's a different way of delivering the service so it starts to it ripples to places that people probably don't quickly think about when yeah. they talk about this i want to take a digital transformation project yeah. yeah and as you guys were mentioning that and sean i think first the corollary to uh, allowing people to wear jeans at work is that's only happened it really could it wasn't magic i mean you know, we still have had our challenges but I think that kind of, the word transparency gets overused, but it did give, I think, a level of understanding. It also allowed us to start to measure what mattered versus, you know, kind of everybody measuring different things and defining success by their individual silo metrics versus overall company. That makes sense? Yeah, I mean, I, I, would, I would agree with all that. I also think, um, and I know Steve, you, you spend time in the, the HR space, I do think, um, we're going to really look at HR software really differently three or four years than we do today. I think that if you see now SAP kind of championing that and in many ways kind of disrupts themselves. And uh, you know, but I don't think that stops at SAP. And I think so. I think it's going to be a very fascinating couple of years on that front as well. As all of a sudden we take a fresh look at like, okay, if our people really are the most important thing in our organization and digital is really owning everything, then how are we going to actually come up with interesting uh, solutions, technology solutions to make them better, faster, and, and enjoy their job more. Yeah. And Steve, I'm sorry if this is overly obvious, but if the CEO is the number one driver of this transformative effort, it will fail. Uh, you know, the two core, if it's not centered around the customer, and if it's not driven by the CEO, it will fail. There's a hundred percent certainty on that. But those the silos, right, remember what the, the few that they talked about were organizational, cultural, data silos, technology silos, and I think the biggie in there's organizational silos. You, you set up the business in the 1990s, not here in 2020. And it's a, the customers are different, so the market's different, expectations are different, and without those, I think it's going to happen. But uh, the big thing I think being driven from the CEO, maybe there'll be, you know, new types of silos somewhat will emerge, but they'll be centered on the right things yeah. and not on uh, legacy or history or what was convenient for the seller, but instead what is essential and necessary for the customer. Well, folks, please join me in, uh, in thanking our, our experts. <laughs> I, I can, so we're gonna, we're gonna basically head to have you guys grab some lunch and about 12:30, so in about 20 minutes, we'll actually have uh, the the keynote up here. But if you want to um, grab some lunch, it will take a little bit of time for everybody to get their food, and then obviously you can be eating still while the, the keynote is is going on. One note: after the keynote, we do have. Um,
copies of the keynote speaker Mo introduced at 12.30, but we have copies of her book afterwards for her to sign as well. So um, there'll be kind of a book signing area set up out there over while we're getting transitioned here as well. So, uh, but grab some food right now if you need to you know, do calls, emails, whatever, but be back here at 12.30 for sure and grab some food. Thanks, guys. The example in industry that wakes up boardrooms across America. And I think Disney Plus is going to completely wake up boardrooms across America around this, like, oh my goodness, we don't need to worry about being disruptive. We actually have unfair competitive advantages in certain situations where we can leverage our assets to actually disrupt the people who've been disrupting us for a long time, right? So if you, if you were on the clock not that long ago, it's not hard to find a lot of Wall Street Journal articles talking about how amazing Netflix is and how Disney was, you know, you should just shovel a little more dirt on that grave and they'll be done, right? And, that, and then Disney rolls out Disney Plus and a couple statistics for you, just because I think they're helpful. First 24 hours of Disney Plus, 10 million people sign up for the service. And then, and then Disney says, hey, we're not gonna announce any more statistics on our downloads until uh, the next release call in February. And to, to Bob's point on app developers and, and software developers in general, right? So, the, the engineers were like, well, that's not a finance that's not a finance problem. We need to get that data. Uh, but we'll just actually get the app downloads and figure it out. So what they've been tracking is a million, 1.2 million Disney Plus downloads a day after that first step, right? And if you look at the market cap over the last six months, what you'll see is Netflix market cap, market cap has decreased about 10%. At the same time, the Disney market cap has increased by about 10%. Because I think all of a sudden people realize, wait, there really are unfair competitive advantages in, in the case of Disney. This amazing rich content library and ability to create content um, that is that is uh, um, extremely competitive. And people will change their behavior. And people will reevaluate their share of wallet based on that. I mean, and, and you know, we have a seven and nine year old kids ourselves, like we were one of those first time, like, like there was no choice, like, you know, food, and water, and thinking about that's what kids need, uh, survive. so like we were, we were in right away, but, but I think, it's not that the Disney didn't have that asset three years ago, right, but I think they were playing defense, and all of a sudden you saw them around us. I think what's going to happen, though, is a lot of other companies are going to start asking themselves in other spaces, okay, what's our unfair competitive business? What's our Disney Plus thing? And I think this will become truly a wake-up call over the next 12 to 18 months uh, across America here. Sean, you know that uh, the, the point you made there about being on offense, not on defense, um, in one of the, the quotes that we showed earlier, we brought this issue of culture. And I think the, the key issue there for these big incumbent companies is, are you going to have a culture that sees you as being at risk, or are you the predator? That's absolutely a choice. You either become the disruptor or you will, of course, be disrupted. And I think there's a series of questions we sometimes go through about uh, give companies an idea for how to assess where they sit on this versus, you know, whatever their mindset is in a vacuum. Are you really that good at it? If anybody would be interested, and I'd be happy to share those questions with you. My email address is bobevanspa at gmail.com. Or and or I'd be happy to share those uh, the quotes from the earnings call this week. So, Mr. Alpine, you have an opportunity through Thomas's digital capabilities as well as your own role as CEO out talking to hundreds or thousands of times of companies in industrial markets around. What's top of mind for them right now? What's their mindset like? And where do you see some of them pulling away from others? Yeah, I, I think. It, 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 it's going to seem so obvious, Bob, I, I think it, it really is about implementation of technology. It really is, is harnessing technology in, in new and innovative ways. I think in the industrial space, the role of data is starting to play. You know, data is the new oil. Everybody knows that. But I think we're starting to see some just fascinating applications of it. Um, it for those that are into manufacturing and, and industrial markets, there's the terminology of industry 4.0, and this really is, is, a, is a buzzy way of talking about the convergence between digital technology and traditional industrial products and services. So as an example, we have a customer of ours um, 
that manufacturers, you know, uh, fail-safe screws really that go into, you know, high-risk environments, airplanes, other types of environments like that. They're not putting sensors in those. They're communicating back via the internet. So the, the level of technology advancement we're seeing just completely, you know, jump forward. And it's kind of to Sean's point, what it's now starting to do is enable new business models. So what we can clearly see is that the companies that you know, factory floor is one thing, that's an ongoing series of things. The companies that are starting to make those investments in data and understand how that plays in their business model are frankly starting to pull away from their competitors and they're creating new businesses, they're advancing. And I, I loved um, Sean's uh, Netflix example on the reverse of Disney, I should say, um, is I think a lot of these companies are waking up and realizing they have an unfair advantage that's been sitting right in front of them. They just didn't really look at it that way. And some of these newer technologies are enabling some new capabilities. You know, the, the industrial internet of things is a big phenomenon. 5G is going to play a massive role in, in the industrial markets. People talk about it as a consumer phenomenon. The, the, the impact it's going to have in the industrial markets is going to dwarf what actually happens in the consumer space. So a lot of enthusiasm around these new techs. So, so one thing just on that quick that I think is important, right? So this morning when we were talking about entrepreneurship, right, people who are creating the world as it should be, right? When companies historically haven't been asking themselves the question, What's our unfair competitive advantage? What are the things we can do that we are uniquely able to do? The, the, the implication of that beyond them going out of business and, and somebody else disrupting them and lots of economics, the other implication of that though is that things that the world desperately needs to just become better aren't being created, right? And, so, and I think actually in the industrial space, you see this uh, all over the place. So, so, um, this afternoon, Gustavo is going to talk a little bit, so I don't want to like steal his thunder, but um, he's on a panel uh, with a couple of people who've created corporate startups, and I have the privilege to be on their advisory board. But this is a 105-year-old company started by Thomas Edison, right, that was literally selling devices that told people when to get out of mines when it was toxic. So it's basically like a, a device version of the canary. Sure, that's not how the marketing department would present it, but the main thing was that I talked about it, right? Now, over the last 105 years, they've become this amazing safety company, you know, publicly traded, uh, and, and they do they do remarkable things. Um, but they had this idea a couple years ago, like, hey, all that we have we have all these sensors, right? And we can do predictive analytics on top of the data coming off the sensors to predict all these safety things proactively instead of reactively, right? And here's the thing. Th those industrial sites need that. Like that's literally saving lives, right? And it's a great idea. And I don't know if my partner Sean is here right now if he's stepped out, but we were talking about safety IO at my venture firm. And um, again, this is a great idea. We sh this is awesome. And I said, yeah, but here's the problem. Like we could we would have a huge cold start problem trying to get three people in a in a startup garage here to start that because we don't know any safety companies. We have no ability to actually solve that data problem with that, right? And, and Safety IO has gone zero to meaningful quickly because it was started inside this company, which to me is, is part of this point. Like, when you do this corporate innovation, there are problems being fixed as well. I mean, not only is there economic economy, but there are problems being fixed as well. So, uh, folks, any questions? Um, you can come and get. So uh, I like the Disney Plus example, but one of the things that occurred to me was sort of the human problem, right? So Netflix is really cool, and getting somebody to believe that you at your industrial company, for example, is going to create the Netflix for safety screws, um, it might be a bit hard. Especially since it, it, the initial work a lot of times is being done inside that industrial technology department is not the stuff that attracts the top end of talent that you want competing directly against the top end of talent that might be at Netflix. So how would you approach that in that kind of environment? Yeah, it, it, it's a great question and, and for those that are, again, are involved anywhere in the manufacturing uh, industry, the, this idea of the skills gap is a massive problem in this country in particular we've got about a little over a million open jobs in U.S. manufacturing right now. We don't buy the high U.S. manufacturing is incredibly healthy industry. It's far healthier than most politicians want to let you know. 
Uh, but, but the fact of the matter is that there's a huge skills gap. Putting that aside for a minute, I think what you're really saying is, hey, if, the, if software is eating the world, and so I'm battling for the develop, you know, developer talent, how would I, as a perhaps non-sexy industrial company, battle Disney or Netflix for, for development talent? And, you know, I, I, I think at the end of the day, um, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that talent is quite as scarce as a lot of people think that it is. I think it, it, um, every industry has its pools and its pockets of talent, and, and not everybody wants to work at a Netflix and at, or at a Facebook. And I think you know a lot of people. There's some regional things, but you know a lot of people don't want the the headaches of working at a company that gets that kind of harsh glare of the spotlight. So I, I do think, in my opinion, the answer is kind of where you started, which is the, it's about the culture. And a lot of people enjoy cultures of companies. It's not just the brand of the company they're attracted to. Yeah, and I feel like we are at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I should plug. Uh, the CMU does a great job partnering with companies that want to do this, and if you're interested in doing that while you're here, the guy who does most of that with us at CSL is Mike Harding, who's in uh, the back of the room there, so he can talk to you about how to get student projects as a great, like, so you get them before they start working. But I also think, like, I think in general, and I've spent a bunch of time with a lot of corporations over the last three years after basically spending the beginning of my career a startup guy who was pretty sure I was unemployable and never hang out in a room like this. Um, I, I, and, I, and I've really grown to, to really enjoy uh, the opportunity to interact with, with many people who are, who are here today. And what I would say is I think many of you have a confidence problem. right? You think that you're not as desirable to the candidates as Facebook and Google is. And here's the thing, if that's how you act, then you will have a problem attracting and retaining those clients. But I think you would be shocked if you went in, again, a little more confident, like, hey, man, this is why working at these kind of companies is amazing, you know, working at, I don't want to pick on any one of your companies, so, but this is why working at my company is amazing, and I think you'd be surprised how much people actually want to work. Hey, Sean, I'll give you a real world example. We were uh, uh, recruiting for a chief data scientist recently, and our company's based in Midtown of Manhattan. So you can imagine, very cheap. talk about a tough <laughs> environment. I'm competing against every hedge fund and you know, everybody out there. I was blown away by the response that we got. And when we got down to the, the five finalists, it was because of the data we had. Yeah. It, it, they were data geeks at the end of the day. And the pool of data in real time that we had is so unique. They're like, hey, I'll, I'll take it to the hedge fund for you. But I, you know, I want the data. And it was. We lack a confidence problem, if you it's will, amazing. recruiting some of these folks. So, so I run a course here every spring semester where I have five industrial companies come in and say, hey, I want you to work with your students to create startups uh, with a bunch of grad students. Mm -hmm. Actually, we worked with Gustavo two years ago on Safety IO. It is one of the most competitive classes to get into on campus at this point. Uh, Nick did it the first year. So it was very competitive year one, and over the last two years, it has become incredibly competitive. I just went and did video interviews with students. I think it's going to be about four and a half applicants for every student that we accept into the program. And, and they're, that's not working at Facebook or Google, that's working at Bosch, at PNC Bank, uh, Phillips Restaurant. I mean, these, these are, these are uh, movies, and these are legacy businesses. People really want to work for you more than I think you think they want to work for you. We've got a question over here, Tony. I just want to say your, your credibility by talking about a lack of confidence when you're wearing a purple sweater. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I did just want to one comment on the, what you were mentioning about manufacturing, so and how it's not quite what it's made out to be. And that's, that's great. It's a really important message. So thanks for that. Um, the question I had was just, I guess, more of a terminology that I heard that maybe even before this band, too, talking about the unfair competitive advantage. And I'm sure, you know, isn't that just competitive advantage? And is it about just getting back to the basics? You know, we talked a little about the war of not losing track of your know, customer needs and what they need. I just thought, is that something yeah, you know, just competitive advantage? Very fair point. I don't know if everybody can hear that. I, th I think he was calling into question the use of unfair advantage. Isn't that just a, a competitive advantage, right? If I understood the question. I, I tend to think, and Sean, I'd love you to get your feedback on this. I tend to think of an unfair advantage of something that's a byproduct of your core business that you haven't yet exploited. And so probably I'm using the wrong term, 
But, you know, I, 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 as an example, I talked about the data that we spin off. That's the digital exhaust from our core business. Suddenly we're looking at that digital exhaust and going, oh, that's worth a lot of money. And so I, we realized that we had this unfair advantage that was sitting in front of us. So that's, at least conceptually, my brain, how I use the term. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, so similar. I mean, to me, to me, like, sort of real talk is, the, the startups that we've been referencing today here and, and all over the region, like they are going to move faster than you are, right? Like I don't think that's groundbreaking. Like they have the ability to, they're, they're just they're going to, you know, in a vacuum, move faster than you. But the problem is that it's going to take them a hundred steps to do this, or they're just flatly unable to do the things that you're able to do. I think that's often where corporate innovation is particularly compelling, right? So it would be really hard for a startup to do a lot of the things that PNC Bank does because it's hard for a startup to get a bank charter. But it turns out PNC Bank not only has a bank charter, but they have a lot of assets behind that bank charter and they know those regulators pretty well. So when PNC Bank wants to spin up um, a product for gig economy workers, it's much easier for PNC Bank to do that than two people in the garage to do that. Question here, that uh, I really appreciated the comments on the three pillars of transformation, model, technology, and culture. And one of the questions that I get a lot, because we have examples of CEOs who are um, really excellent at driving innovation in the organization, but for small, medium, large sized companies that don't have somebody at the top who's really effective at driving innovation, have you seen any examples or um, roles for middle management to play in trying to drive cultural change in our organization. Yeah, so to me, on this one, one of the things I think that, that's interesting is there, it's amazing what you can do with a little bit of time at the, on the side of your desk just to prove momentum and, uh, and sort of early wins there. And I think that's true in SMBs, but it's also true in the, the largest of large companies. Um, uh, Beth Comstock wrote a great book, if you haven't read it, about her time doing stuff at, at General Electric or as vice chairman there. And she, she said people come to her office all the time and say, like, oh, like, uh, you know, I need, you know, a million dollars and I need this and I need that. And then I'll do something really innovative. And she's like, well, let me see your calendar. And she'd show them, like, oh, well, here's, here's you know, 16 hours over the next two weeks that you could go get some, some early quick wins. And I think this sort of side of your desk innovation in places where there may not be a top-down mandate become really compelling for this. Yeah, the only thing I would add to it is where I've seen um, both the problem but also a solution to it is if you think about what middle management does in most companies of size, is they're driving the deliberate processes that run the core business day to day. So when you ask them, hey, what, what new ideas do you have? Sometimes they, you know, they're like, you, I can't take my hands off the wheel. And at the same point in time, I find in a lot of companies, some of the best ideas actually come from people in middle management. And so I think, to Sean's point, finding the right mechanisms to capture those ideas, and then once you have them, put them in the emergent strategies group. Don't have the same people that are driving deliberate strategy running an emergent strategy, because I guarantee it won't. <laughs> that, you know, we've all seen that movie, but and I think that's the other mistake companies make. They have a cool new idea, and they give it to the person running a massive division whose hair's on fire running a core business. That, that model, you know, simply isn't gonna work. Uh, Louis, do we have time for one more question? Yeah. Good, because I played poker with this guy and uh, it could be very risky. If... <laughs> I, I actually wanted to ask a question because I didn't want Tony to feel bad about wearing purple today. So, uh, you know, uh, this is really for all of you folks. Uh, you opened this, the session with silos and if anybody's been in corporate America and hasn't heard the word silos, then you fell asleep. Uh, we've been talking about silos forever, okay? And, and uh, my question to you is, are, are you really saying here that digital transformation is going to break down silos because people can't hide from that anymore? Is that what you're saying? Because silos culturally will continue unless there's something different or there's a real mandate to break those silos down, uh, whether it comes from upper management or across or, or a whole new whole new viewpoint in the corporation. So uh, is it because it did, you can't hide from data and that will break the silos down? 
Well, I, again, I don't want to kick the can down the road. It wasn't my quote, but I agree with the quote uh, on the silos. I, I'll, I'll just try to use my experience as an example. I will say, as, as companies I've been involved in, where we start to connect from interest to invoice, and we've got the clarity of, of the data and understand it, and we've got a very clear profit formula, and by that I don't just mean that we make money or don't, I mean literally what is it that we measure. When you get that right, boy, it tends to expose a lot of things. It tends to expose inefficiencies. It tends to expose you know, silos. When, when I joined Thomas three years ago, it's a 122-year-old family-owned company. No outside investors, no debt on the company. We have employees that have been there for 40 years. So you can imagine how in, ingrained some of the silo of thinking was as we started to transform. Well, I could stand up all day long and preach the idea of collaboration and all that nonsense and nobody would listen to me. All I had to do was start to connect this stuff through the digital. It, really could. it wasn't magic. I mean, you know, we still have had our challenges, but I, I think that kind of, I, the word transparency gets overused, but it did give, I think, a level of understanding. It also allowed us to start to measure what mattered versus you know, kind of everybody measuring different things and defining success by their individual silo metrics versus overall company. That makes sense? Yeah, I, mean, I, I, would, I would agree with all that. I also think, um, and I know Steve, you, you spend time in the, the HR space. I do think um, we're going to really look at HR software really differently three or four years than we do today. I think that if you see now SAP kind of championing that and in many ways kind of disrupts themselves. And, uh, you know, but I don't think that stops at SAP. I think so. I think it's going to be a very fascinating couple of years on that front as well. As all of a sudden we take a fresh look at, like, okay, if our people really are the most important thing in our organization, and digital is really owning everything, then how are we going to actually come up with interesting uh, solutions, technology solutions, to make them better, faster, and, and enjoy their job more? Yeah. And Steve, I'm sorry if this is overly obvious, but if the CEO is the number one driver of this transformative effort, it will fail. Uh, you know, the two core that it's not sent around the customer, and if it's not driven by the CEO, it will fail. There's a hundred percent certainty on that. But those the silos, right? Remember what the, the few that they talked about were organizational, cultural, data silos, technology silos, and I think the biggie in there is organizational silos. You, you set up the business in the 1990s, not here in 2020. And it's a, the customers are different, so the market's different, expectations are different, and without those, I think it's gonna happen. But uh, the big thing here, I think, being driven from the CEO, maybe there'll be you know new types of silos, somewhat will emerge, but they'll be centered on the right things, and not on, uh, legacy or history, what was convenient for the seller, but instead what is essential and necessary for the customer. Well, folks, please join me in uh, in thanking our, our experts.